video and we're ready to start now. Okay. Everybody ready? Go ahead. I'd like to show how Ben Franklin used his scientific appreciation of rope or thread to promote union among the colonies. At present, we are like separate filaments of flax before the thread is formed. Without strength, because without connection. But union would make us strong. But I was surprised when the request for uh, a little presentation on the history of H&A came along. And it really didn't seem that fascinating. But it was fun as I dug back in the ancient history to find that I could go back so far as, you know, maybe 30, 40,000 years, the Cro-Magnon days. And everything I kept reading um, gave a few more clues along that line. And, you know, you run across things all the time. But it comes out as you begin to study these things. And uh, I was also surprised to see all the speculation on what could be done with really super ropes in the future, too. Well, that was fun. I, I've enjoyed the, uh, the going back and going in the future uh, since my retirement. at Xenia, Ohio, spinning golden threads into endless yarns for rope and twine. Hooven and Allison, two master rope makers, were pioneers of the cordage industry in the Middle West during Civil War days. With faith in the future of industrial progress by Americans, with Americans, and for Americans. Bill? I got to switch to the uh, microphone there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Bill, tell me, what is a rope? What goes into making a rope? Well, we start out with the fiber, which is just a tiny element that comes from the, from the uh, stem of a plant or from the leaf. And then uh, when a bunch of small fibers are twisted together, you have what you call a yarn. Then you twist several yarns together to get a strand, and then twist several strands together to get a rope. The story of rope stretches back through every culture to the dawn of civilization. My own connection to rope began in the town of Xenia, Ohio. A 
Of course, our local history of rope making really gets going around 1850. was a milling operation when my great-grandparents settled here in the 1850s. They dammed the creek and brought the water down over a water wheel to power the mill, turn the grindstones, and uh, the Beaver Creek operation was in my mother's family, but my father's family had a milling operation in Alpha, just two miles to the east of here. And in addition to the milling operation, they were also distillers. But it wasn't until, uh, I think, 1869 that my great uncle Jacob Harbine got involved with the formation of the Hooven and Allison Company in Xenia. That was an, uh, the operation that was set up to make rope. How commonplace is rope, and yet how varied its uses, whether it's a roping exhibition, a hoisting job, or tethering a giant liner. Rope does the work. Bill, can you explain for me what a rope walk was? Uh, the, the rope walk was, was a building, eventually, to protect you from the weather. And it was a long, slim building, a quarter of a mile long, with a spinning wheel at one end, with axles bearing a series of hooks. And it was called a rope walk because the master rope maker had untwisted yarns wound around his waist, just very loosely. And he would walk away from the uh, spinning wheel, running hemp through his fingers to facilitate winding. And he would have to walk backward in order to do this. When spun, the yarns were twisted into strands, which in turn were hand twisted into the desired rope size. Around the Civil War, the rope industry was mechanized. Well, in the mid-1800s, the rope making was a very simple operation and didn't require much capital investment, not much machinery. So there were a lot of independent operations. It was almost like um, the home weavers. But when machinery was started to be required because it was, it was more efficient, then it took more capital. And then companies were organized and it was no longer a uh, 
domestic operation. And in Xenia, in particular, there were six rope companies. Then as soon as they, that became um, the way of doing business, there started to be a consolidation of those companies. And the National Cordage Trust was formed. And it was buying up cordage manufacturers all over the United States, including five of the rope factories in Xenia. shareholders, they just resisted all the attempts to uh, buy H&A. Eventually, the trust was broken up by the federal government. Uh, the Antitrust Act, which was in the uh, late 1800s. Um, you may know the antitrust laws best from the fact that they broke up what was Standard Oil Company that threatened to be um, take over all the oil production in the states. Trust laws, in my opinion, cut their teeth on breaking up the National Cordage Trust, that very dangerous big monopoly of rope makers. Here, yep. H&A Blue Heart Pure Manila Rope is being subjected to a most destructive wearing and straining test. A continuous grind with a heavy load, hour after hour. Days of testing and no sign of rupture or wear. The third degree, testing its maximum breaking strength. One half inch. 2,800 pounds. An inch and one quarter. Fourteen thousand pounds, two inches. Thirty-two thousand pounds, dramatic proof of super strength. The trademark of strength and durability. The thread in the center, blue heart, red heart, and purple heart rope. Manufactured under the banner of quality. Well, I'm supposed to explain a bit about the construction of the rope. This is our favorite Blue Heart Manila rope. But first I want to show you that it is made of three strands. And the strands can be unwound like so. Three strands. And then we have each strand is comprised of seven yarns. It took seven yarns to make the single strand for half inch rope. And I think that you can see that there are seven yarns here. And then each yarn 
is composed of literally hundreds of manila fibers. And in addition to the yarns we have in the Blue Heart Manila Rope, the marker, the Blue Heart, which is a trademark identifying our top line of Manila Rope. Now we also use the red marker to make a, a red heart in sisal rope and purple heart in some other ropes. But the blue heart was the top of the line before the synthetics came on. Okay, now tell me about these fibers. Where did the rope industry get its fibers? Well, for a long time, for thousands of years, hemp was the fiber for making cordage of any sort and for making high-strength textiles. Well, the hemp came in from European countries, and I believe that it came with the pilgrims to Plymouth Rock. Uh, presumably, they brought it for the fiber. In any event, hemp grew beautifully in the Midwestern section in Ohio and even better in Kentucky. And so hemp growing was one of the principal crops around here in the early 1800s. But when it was discovered that uh, sisal and manila had even better strength and more, were more lasting, and when it was uh, when uh, international transportation, particularly ocean transportation, became very efficient, then the importing of sisal and Manila from the tropical countries uh, displaced hemp almost completely. So that um, there was very little hemp growing. Oh, after um, after World War. One, it's very little then. Bill, describe sisal for us. Where does it come from and what does it look like? Sisal plant looks like, well, what you think of as a cactus with the uh, branches that are maybe uh, shoulder high. From the cream of the crop in far off Yucatan, Mexico, Africa, and Java comes sisal fiber. Fiber producing leaves are cut away and the leaves bundled for removal to the cleaning machines. A machine called Raspador separates the fiber from the pulp after which it is hung on racks to dry. Later it is packed in bales weighing 400 pounds for shipment. But Manila comes from a plant that looks more like a banana and it grows 15, 20 feet high. It is a cousin to the banana except that the fruit is very small and unappetizing. Uh, Abaca, incidentally, is the proper name for the manila hemp producing plant. The trunk of the abaca is composed of fold upon fold of leafy substance. In it, like the strings and celery, are the desirable fibers. The plant matures in three years and is then cut down, slit open, and the sheathing layers removed. A scraping process removes the pulp, leaving the long silky fiber, which after being thoroughly dried in the sun, is rolled into small bundles, delivered to the government balers for grading, and packed in bales weighing 270 pounds for shipment and fabrication into rope. Anytime my wife Gracie and I would take a trip, and we love to travel, we would always try to visit the plantations where the fiber was grown. It must have been in the late 1940s we went to the abaca farms down in Panama. That was with a group of other cordage people from the Cordage Institute, the uh, Trade Association of Rope Manufacturers. Well, I suppose the most memorable one was to Tanyanyika now Tanzania, in 1964. And this was after an African safari that Gracie and I had taken with the Cincinnati Zoo. 
when I took my favorite picture of all times, the picture of the giraffe. Since we were already in Kenya, we decided to go down to Tanganyika and visit some of the plantations. But our, our welcome was unusual because Gracie was with me and we got to know some of the families a bit because Gracie was such a, a good communicator. We got acquainted and that was a lot of fun. Um, and Gracie, got, I got some pictures with Gracie turning the crank on some of the primitive equipment that they had down there. The little bit of um, fiber that they twisted on their machinery was just a household operation, you know, two or three people, enough for, for just a local community, not, not they weren't selling um, twisted products, they were shipping baled fiber um, to Europe and the States. And the same. Well, many years ago when I was in New Zealand, I saw a demonstration that convinced me that you didn't need any tools at all to make rope and twine. There was a Maori native who was able to roll some, some filaments on his leg with one hand, twisting the yarns, and with the other hand, he plied them together to make a two-ply twine. And I was just amazed because I had always thought that that some sort of machinery was required for making rope. But this demonstrated that no tools at all and nothing, and of course nothing else, no glue or um, any binder of any sort was really required. Now I'd like to ask a very basic technical question. How do you make a rope if you have only a bunch of short fibers? Well, you know, you twist them together. Twisting is a very basic, a fundamental concept, a way of grouping small elements, the fibers, into a larger, more useful form. Without any glue, or cement, or anything else. But if you want a long rope, and the individual fibers are relatively short, there's a problem, which I'll demonstrate. Okay. On the left, you see a single brick supported by a single yarn. On the right, you see three bricks supported by two yarns. That's one and a half bricks per yarn. The yarn is untwisting, but as the one on the right untwists, the two yarns lock together so that twist is locked in and the friction continues. You notice as the brick on the left untwists the yarn, the yarn stretches just a little bit. That's because the fibers slip by one another slightly. And after, after a while, when the yarns become almost completely parallel, then they have no friction against one another, so that... <laughs> Well, I've demonstrated the answer to the untwisting problem, that is, multiple yarns. Two or more yarns, twisted together, make a strong strand. 
with the twist locked in. And three strands make a serviceable rope. So you don't need any tools to make a rope. You can separate fibers easily from many leafy plants. Did you ever pull a piece of stringy celery between your teeth? Easy fiber extraction and simple twisting, all without tools, leads me to the conclusion that cordage was man's first manufactured product. Stretched out far below lie the mammoth mills of Xenia's leading industry, representing an investment of millions of dollars, where the great drone of hundreds of busy spinners echo as a tribute to the pioneer's ideal, quality cordage, plants covering 45 acres and manufacturing millions of pounds of products annually, a source of tax income for state and federal governments. The fiber begins its long journey through the mill down through the deep canyons of pile after pile of bale fiber it travels. Bales, bales, bale after bale, rising from floor to roof, high above our heads. Fiber from China, India, Africa, New Zealand, the Philippines, and Java, from the far corners of the world, off the beaten paths of civilization. From this faraway land to Xenia, Ohio. Well, I was saying that there was very little hemp growing after World War I. Well, that's not quite true because at the start of World War II, the, the difficulty in shipping due to the, um, the war interfered with the importing of sisal and manila from the tropical countries. So even though hemp was outlawed, because of the marijuana effect when, when imports uh, during World War II were very difficult, hemp came back strong. Long ago, when these ancient Grecian temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years, even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the Western Seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. For the sailor, no less than the hangman, hemp was indispensable. Then came cheaper imported fibers for cordage, like jute, sisal and manila hemp, and the culture of hemp in America declined. But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our army and navy, as well as of our industries. This is hemp seed. Be careful how you use it. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal... The growing of hemp was restarted in the States and became a, uh, an important uh, factor in, in our industry during World War II.
charitable uses, both on ship and shore. Okay, Bill, why do you think you became an engineer? I'm not sure what it was that interested me in engineering to start with. I think perhaps while I was hospitalized with my first hip operation, I had more time to study um, and get interested in things mechanical. It was just toys at that time, of course. It was terrible to be in bed and confined to bed for, I don't know, weeks at a time. If the nurse managed to relocate the dresser with a big mirror on it in, in my hospital room so that the mirror would look down at the street, I think I might still recognize the corner I spent hours just watching traffic. There were a lot of things that I couldn't do for many, many months. But I could stay at home and I enjoyed uh, learning to play chess. My Uncle Ed was an inventor and he had all sorts of patents on strange things. Nothing that uh, really paid off handsomely though. And I think he encouraged me to do all sorts of tinkering on my own, too. Well, I had no idea I was going to spend my career as a cordage engineer. In fact, I went to MIT and got my bachelor's and master's in chemical engineering. And then when World War II came around, I got radar electronics training and then served in the Army Air Corps in England. And we arrived in London just at the end of the man bombing raids and the start of the V1s and V2s. Um, you know those machines that they were the unmanned flying bombs and the V2s were the first of the rockets that came in over the channel. And uh, uh, you get used to that after a while. Amazing. So rather than going down in the bomb shelter in the basement, we'd go out on the roof and watch the V1s coming over because there were fireworks all the anti-aircraft guns shooting at the V1s, they were, they were just fantastic. More fireworks than I've ever seen on the 4th of July. But of course the V2s, the rockets, were unpredictable. They go, there was no going out on the roof. <laughs> well, the first assignment I had was to go out to Great Malvern where the civilian laboratory was located to pick up these little connectors for the jammers that we were installing in planes. When we got to the stock room where the connectors were, he introduced me to the gal in the stock room. He said, Grace, this is Lieutenant Hagenbaugh. Give him anything he wants. <laughs> So you see how, how seriously we took our assignments. We were married soon after the end of the war. And it seemed that the best thing to do would be to go into the family business. Let's see, I started work at the H&A in 1946. Well, this is the hard fiber mill building 
built in 1904. And the aerial shot shows all three mills at the Xenia location. Three mills? Yeah. In addition to the rope mill, we had a soft fiber mill and an oakum mill. But I don't have time to describe those just now. Let me tell you about the operation and walk you through the plant from the time when the fibers arrived to shipping out the finished ropes. Tim Hearson was taking the pictures in 1973, I believe, and the process of making the, the uh, natural fiber ropes was the same in 73 as it was in the 40s when I was there, when I first started there. Was the rope making process basically the same in the 1800s? I don't think it was the same. I, I think this process of, of making hard fiber rope started when the new mill was built in 1904. I think in the 1800s, it was, it was a very different process, very, much less mechanized. So the rope making you're about to describe is basically unchanged since 1904. I think so, yes. Well, obviously, the first step in the process is to bring in the sisal and manila yarn, which is imported from tropical countries. It comes in by rail, and that's not the locally grown hemp anymore, that's imported fiber. It's unloaded from the rail car and stacked in the warehouse. The fiber was moistened with a little emulsion, a little bit of oil, and then cut to the proper length so that it would pass through the hackle machines okay. Then the fibers are fed into the first breaker, which is the first combing operation. You get piles of fiber that you see here, uh, that's a sliver, and that's fed into a second and third operation. At first, the fiber doesn't stick very well together so that you have to use a conveyor belt to feed the fiber into the machine. But later on, when the fibers are staggered in length, then they can lift the sliver into the next machine. Oh, oh, if the fibers all ended at the same place, then the fiber would pull apart easily. If they're overlapped um, so that the lengths are randomized, then it's hard to slip one by the other. In the finisher machine, they're pulled out into long, thin slivers and piled in a, in a can for transporting to the spinners. Of course, all the twine had to be put up on bobbins. And here's a stack of the bobbins that were being ready to be filled. I don't know whose shoe that is. Mills giving employment to hundreds of free American workers enjoying the American standard of living. And speaking of workers, suppose we drop in to meet them. We present the Hooven and Allison personnel. Happy, contented employees in good environment safeguard the processing of high quality cordage. The H&A's most important product was agricultural twine, and the farmers needed a lot of that twine. But the foreign fiber suppliers were already starting their own factories, producing cheaper twine 
and we even had to compete with prison labor as the Midwestern prisons of the time ran their own twine factories and sold very cheap twine to the farmers. The H&A was the major employer in Xenia, and at its peak it had up to a thousand employees. Well, at the factory we had hundreds of machines spinning yarns. But the, in the real old days, the only machine used to make rope was a wheel, and the rope maker had to walk backward. That was a lot of walking. To make 10 feet of yarn, you had to walk 10 feet backward. But to make a rope, you had to make many, many yarns, and then twist those yarns together into a strand. And you still need three or more strands to make a rope. So to make a one inch diameter rope, the length of a football field, you had to walk, well, maybe a mile. And that is all backward too. The spinners are the machines which were produced in Miamisburg, Ohio. Miamisburg must have been a big manufacturing center for a lot of machinery. We used the hundreds of these machines. You can see that we had many gals operating the spinners. This was an operation that mostly the women took care of and uh, the, the uh, employment of women was, was unusual at that time in Xenia. It was fairly dusty, but we had good ventilation compared with most factories. Power machinery uh, was just terribly noisy. Bill, can you make the noises of the machinery? I don't know. I guess. That's as good as I can do. <laughs> and of course, the spinners produced the yarn. And here you see the creels with multiple yarns, which will be twisted together to form one strand for a three-strand rope. And here you see a three-inch diameter rope made on the H&A's largest rope machinery, the cable layer. Rope is made by combining and twisting two or more yarns into a strand and by twisting three or more strands to form or lay a rope. The twist in making the rope is in the opposite direction from the twist of the strands, resulting in perfectly balanced construction. If you look at each of the yarns, you'll find that it has a Z twist in it. That's the Z. And then each strand has an S twist in it. If you can imagine an S imposed over the center there, the center slope of the yarn is an S. And then the final construction, the uh, three strands are twisted together with a Z configuration, the center of the Z being this direction coming across there. We have one more picture here, and that's the piles of, of binder twine as they are in the warehouse before they're shipped out to the farm market. 
Progressive farmers spend thousands of hours and thousands of dollars in planning, in labor, in the finest of mechanized equipment to make American farms the most productive in the world. They need and deserve the best of equipment and supplies. The U.S. cordage industry is doing its part in supplying reliable, economical twine. Twine that runs free through the baler, that bales without snagging, that knots without snarling, that keeps the bales secure in the field or barn until needed, that resists rot, rodents, and mildew, and handles without breaking. Every foot of U.S.-made baler twine is made to hold bales of 50, 60, 70 pounds. But this is not the end of the twine story. Forward-looking cordage men are constantly seeking ways to improve the product. New materials, new blends, new methods of manufacturing are being explored and tested by the industry. To date, no adequate substitute has been found that has the advantages of strength, long life, and the low cost of sisalana. Well, of course, the, the fibers that we had been using for many years, uh, principally manila and sisal, were becoming more expensive because the shipping to bring in, in, those fibers in from tropical countries was getting to be more expensive. And we realized that the new synthetics were going to be much cheaper and much better for the cordage. That was really the basic reason why I was hired, I believe, to uh, introduce synthetics into the process. Um, the knower synthetics made mostly from from petroleum oil, uh, polypropylene seemed to be the most promising. And it was supplied in the form of tiny pellets about the size of a grain of rice. Well, first it's melted and then extruded through a, squeezed through a flat orifice and hot stretched lengthwise so it develops strength in the direction of the hot stretch and loses strength crosswise as the, uh, as the molecules orient themselves. The sheet will tend to break up what we call fibrillate so that it becomes almost fibers by themselves. Can you see that that might have been a film at one time? After the hot stretching and the spinning of the yarn, all of the machinery was the same. It would work just as well on the uh, twine making machinery and balling machinery and the rope laying machinery as did the natural fibers. That does it? Well, not yet. We have a few more ideas to go okay. through. The H&A was one of the last U.S. makers of natural fiber rope. It survived so long because of the product diversity. Sisal, manila, jute, plumber's packing, and finally, synthetics. But in the end, many factors led to the decline and the final closing of the H&A in 2004. Our major products had been binder and baler twine for the farmers, but family farms all but disappeared. And today's combines don't use any twine. In shipping, synthetic ropes last longer, so fewer are sold. Tape and adhesives have completely replaced packaging twine. So our market shrank. Then China, India, Mexico, and Brazil built their own factories for synthetics too. And H&A just couldn't compete any longer.
Unfortunately, they had already shut off the sprinklers. The fact that there was no activity at the plant apparently made a interesting place for some kids to play around. That was in the year 2005. Well, I'd like to close on the most hopeful view of the prospect for the cordage technology. Carbon nanotubes. They're literally hundreds of times stronger than Kevlar. And if they can make a rope strong enough and light enough so that it can, can hold its own weight for 22,000 miles, just imagine the possibilities. You could run a rope of NATO tubes from a stationary satellite down to Earth and literally climb up that rope to the satellite. But this is much more efficient than the rockets that we're using now. And beyond the satellite, you can eventually use such super strong ropes to get to the moon and the planets. Thirty thousand years ago, did the Cro-Magnons realize the significance of their work when they twisted a few short fibers together to make a longer string? Well, I'm not sure, but with this and related mental feats, these ancient humans kicked off the scientific and engineering revolution, which has carried us to the moon. And finally, I'll give you a quotation. When humans begin to inhabit the moon and planets other than Earth, they may not use the modern technology of rockets. Instead, space travel and settlement may depend upon an ancient technology invented long before modern history, string. That take care of it? Yeah, sure. Anything else that's at the camera?